Okay. So, um, I could, sure, could start my video, couldn't I? That would help. There we go. Hi, everyone. Okay. So, um, I'm very excited to introduce uh, our first speaker. Uh, like I say, we're very lucky to have um, Clint di dialing in from overseas to talk to us today. Um, Clint is the head of security research for R2C, which is a startup working on uh, giving security tools directly to developers. Um, I was going to quickly talk through his bio. I'm sure he'll tell us who he is as well, but I want to make sure we cover everything because um, he certainly does have a, an impressive CV. Um, before his current role, uh, Clint was a research director at uh, NCC Group, a global security consulting firm where he helped companies implement security automation and DevOps best practices, as well as performing penetration tests for companies ranging from large enterprises to new startups. Um, he has previously spoken at conferences, including Black Hat USA, um, OWASP AppSec USA, EU AppSec Cali, B-Side San Francisco, uh, many DevSecCons. And uh, he also holds a PhD in computer science from the University of California, Davis. Um, I can also recommend uh, firsthand that you check out TLDRSEC, which is its uh, newsletter. Um, it contains curated summaries of recent security talks, links, um, other resources from around the world. And it's uh, definitely a really great resource for uh, keeping up to date on what's currently going on in the, in the AppSec space and the InfoSec space. So. Uh, yeah, without further ado, um, I'm really excited to hand over to, to Clint. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, it's uh, lovely to join you all virtually. Uh, I'm sad that I can't be in person. I actually uh, visited Israel for the first time uh, last year for DevSecCon Tel Aviv, uh, and it was awesome. Uh, I loved it. Um, I went to uh, Falafel Johnny's in Tel Aviv. I don't know if that's a, a place you all have been, uh, but it was wonderful. Um, I don't think uh, my life will ever be quite the same since I experienced uh, Israeli PETA. So um, yeah, so happy to be here, hopefully in person next time. Um, but yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, an open source tool my company and I have been building called SemGrep. Uh, also, if you want to access these slides, uh, you can just go to the uh, link there. And feel free to reach out on uh, Twitter or other things. Uh, always happy to chat. OK, as a motivating example for this talk, I think we all have had the experience where we're doing a code review, whether it's for uh, quality or security. And perhaps there's something that you find yourself like, ah, I'm always writing this, like, hey, maybe we used to use this one method. We should use this other one. Or make sure you do this uh, authentication or authorization check, things like that. Uh, I think every code base has uh, assumptions, requirements, or coding standards um, that should be followed. And there are some tools that exist for sort of language or specific framework, say a web application framework, sort of generic checks. But I, I think it's, at least in my experience, it's not easy to sort of codify code patterns that are unique to your project and org. And I think SEMGREP is a, a great tool for doing these sort of um, very specific custom checks. And we'll see why in a second. Uh, but before we get into it, just a little bit about me. Um, yeah, so I work at R2C. Uh, we're a San Francisco-based startup. This is our uh, <laughs> obligatory uh, quarantine Zoom uh, company photo. Uh, as uh, Josh said, uh, I was previously at NCC Group. Before that, I was an indentured servant, I mean, a grad student at UC Davis. Uh, feel free to reach out on Twitter, or I do have a newsletter at tldrsec.com. So, uh, what is SEMGREP? Sort of the too long didn't read is it's a, a very customizable, lightweight static analysis tool for finding bugs. So why is it nice for uh, security consultants and researchers? It's open source, right? So a lot of these sort of commercial tools have a very restrictive licensing that when I was a consultant at NCC Group, I just couldn't use. Uh, it's nice in that it supports many languages. So Go, Java, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, Ruby, uh, and many more. Uh, and we're constantly adding more. So you can just sort of learn one tool and apply it many places. There's over a thousand out of the box rules. So you can just get started uh, quite easily. Another nice feature is that it does not require buildable source code. So oftentimes uh, on engagements, I would get source code that would either be uh, partial or at least not have um, all of these sort of internal dependencies. So I couldn't build it. Uh, but I think the key most interesting feature is that when you are writing uh, SEMGREP rules, you're writing 
taking basically whatever programming language you're targeting. So if you're trying to find code patterns in Python, you're writing Python. If you're trying to find uh, Java, you're writing Java. And we'll do a couple of examples of that uh, in a second. Uh, so why is it nice for application security engineers and developers? Uh, again, if you have sort of coding standards or things that you want to enforce that are either documented on a wiki or just in your brain, you just know them, or maybe in the code itself, uh, it's very easy to create sort of custom checks and then enforce them continuously in CI, whether that's on GitHub, GitLab, Travis, uh, or so forth. Okay, so the outline of this talk, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of sort of background about this space, talking about grep and abstract syntax trees. Uh, but the majority of the talk will be sort of live demos, like how can I and you use uh, SEMgrep today. We'll talk a little bit about the registry, so what are the out-of-the-box checks that you get. And uh, finally, we'll talk a little bit about integrations, putting it into uh, CICD pipelines. Uh, and feel free to stop me uh, at any time and ask questions, or we'll have time for questions at the end. So whatever you'd prefer. Okay, so grep and abstract syntax trees. Um, so let's say you are a security engineer and you want to find all calls to exec in your code base because um, you're like, well, if a, an attacker's input could reach that, then uh, potentially there would be some sort of uh, arbitrary code execution. So this is dangerous. So I just want to find all the places where exec is called. Um, so here's a couple of examples of how that may look in source code. And let's say we were like, okay, well, let's just use grep to find it because uh, grep uh, is an awesome security tool. So these first two examples, like, OK, these are not too bad. We could just look for exec and then an open parenthesis. Um, this third example, it's like, well, there's some white space there. Um, that's a little bit annoying to start finding with a regular expression. Uh, but there could also be new lines uh, in the middle. That's going to be a bit of a pain. Uh, there could be a different function that ends in exec. Um, which, so that's not actually that's uh, sort of hard. We'd have to do some sort of uh, look behind. Uh, but also it could be in a comment, it could be in a string literal, uh, and, and pretty soon this is getting to be a pain. Um, this is the obligatory XKCD reference. Uh, if you're having Perl problems, I feel bad for you, son. Got 99 problems, use regexes, uh, now I have 100 problems. And I think the challenge here is that when you are using, say, grep or rip grep, which is a, a faster version, um, basically these are operating on source code as strings. Uh, but source code is not a string. Uh, the way a compiler or an interpreter sees it is really more like a tree or as a graph. So um, ideally, we would like to be able to reason about code like, oh, this is a function definition, this is a function call, um, this is an annotation, uh, and things like that, rather than just sort of contextless strings. So there are a number of tools that do tree matching already, a bunch of open source ones. For example, Bandit, Dlint, ESLint, uh, and so forth. But the problem with these tools is that they all have their own abstract syntax tree uh, syntax. So if you have a couple of languages in your environment, you would sort of need to learn how each of these tools represent uh, the syntax. And oftentimes, there's also many ways in a programming language to uh, say basically the same sort of semantic expression. Um, so it's sort of a, a bit uh, effortful to sort of cover all these cases yourself. Um, so this is uh, an example from ESLint uh, on the right, where it's, uh, I think, 307 lines of code to basically find all calls to eval. Um, so uh, it works great, but that's a bit of a heavy lift if we were to write it ourselves. Uh, so a figure from this um, Instagram blog post that I think is really nice um, presents uh, static analysis as a spectrum, right? It's not just all sort of one uniform thing. So again, on the left-hand side, we have um, things that are very easy to do, um, but they're not very smart, so like regexes. And then on the right-hand side, we have these uh, very powerful, very complex sort of whole program analysis where you're reasoning about, say, control and data flow through an entire program. Um, and so where does SEMGREP fit into this? Uh, it's basically in the middle. It's trying to take sort of the advantages of both uh, by being sort of fast and intuitive, but also uh, can do a bit more fancier, uh, higher level analyses. OK, so let's uh, get into it a bit. So we'll talk uh, first about some sort of base use cases, how uh, the uh, just sort of like the simplest things you might want to do. And then we'll talk about some of the more advanced things. Um, so again, the example from before, let's say uh, we want to find all calls to exec or some other dangerous function. Um, oh, yeah, so just. Yeah. 
So if you're curious, uh, SimGrep is on GitHub. Um, again, LGPL. Uh, if you want, there's um, a sort of landing page for simgrep.dev that just links to various things. Um, we'll look at a few more of these in a minute. Um, but we also have this editor called simgrep.dev, which is basically um, just like a nice way to write rules without installing anything. So you could install uh, SEMgrep with, say, Docker or PIP or uh, Homebrew. Uh, but if you would rather just give it a try without installing anything, you can just uh, do that here. So uh, this input box is basically uh, how we're going to express what we're going to look for, like the SEMgrep pattern. Uh, here is test code that is going to, um, the pattern is going to try to be, uh, it's trying to match uh, this test code. And then if we match anything, it's just going to appear here on the right-hand side. So no magic here. It's just running uh, SimGrep in the back end in Docker for us uh, so we don't have to install anything. OK, so we have a couple of different examples here uh, of how exec may look uh, based on the previous slide. So uh, what we can do is basically say exec, open parentheses. In, so SimGrep patterns are essentially Actually, whatever code we are targeting, except for uh, essentially two abstractions. Uh, so one of them we call the ellipsis operator, uh, or dot, dot, dot. And what that means is this could be zero or more arguments. Uh, I don't care what's inside. So here we're saying find all calls to exec uh, with any number of arguments. So uh, if we run this, we can see we matched. Uh, this and this because these are calls to exec. We did not match this because this is actually a different function call and white space didn't matter. And we did not match the comment or the string literal because again, the, that's not actually calling uh, exec. And one thing that's interesting here is notice uh, this first call. Um, so here we are doing import exec as safe function. So within this scope, uh, safe function is aliased to exec. And then we're calling safe function on uh, you know, some sort of variable. So what's neat about this is in our pattern, we were not aware that, uh, or we didn't have to codify any additional logic that um, a function uh, could be aliased locally. Uh, but SEMGREP sort of did the smart thing and found it regardless. Um, so again, SEMGREP is trying to sort of abstract some of the complexity away from you and basically just find like what you intended to find. Um, so the ellipsis operator, uh, which can match zero or more arguments or statements or things like that is basically the first thing you need to learn. Uh, and then there's basically one more. And then you've learned uh, the majority of, of how to use SEMGRIP. OK, so uh, any questions? Or shall I go to uh, the next example? OK, yeah. So, oh. so yeah, I said to. Uh... So I'm asking, I just wanted to clarify for everyone. I think I might have locked everyone on mute just to keep everything quiet. But if anyone wants to ask questions, feel free to put into the chat box and we'll unmute you or we'll, we'll ask the question and maybe we'll, we'll open it up for questions at the end as well. But yeah, in the meantime, feel free to write questions into the chat, everyone. OK, cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, happy to do now or, or at the end, whatever people would like. OK, so let's look at um, the other primitive. Um, so let's say we have some uh, Express.js code, uh, which is a popular web application framework in uh, JavaScript. Uh, and here we can see that we are uh, defining a route, uh, getting a query parameter, and then sending it directly back in the response. Um, so because we are taking user input and including it uh, directly in the response, this is uh, potentially cross-site scripting. Uh, because we're not doing any uh, output encoding or filtering or anything like that. So let's uh, try to write a custom rule to find this. So we can actually just copy the code we want to find up to here. And then basically, we're going to um, uh, abstract this away a little bit until it's uh, finding what we're wanting to find. So the uh, dot, dot, dot operator can also be used inside uh, quotes to basically mean uh, you know, this could be anything. Uh, I don't care uh, what's inside this string, but it's like some string. Um, and the second thing we can use is uh, something called meta variables. So you can think of meta variables like a capture group in regular expressions, where basically you're like, I don't know what this is ahead of time, but I want to capture a reference to it. And 
uh, within one pattern, uh, it is uh, enforced to be the same. So basically here we might say, okay, we are um, accessing this request object and uh, getting uh, this parameter out of it, but we it might not necessarily be um, uh, like specifically name, like obviously this could be any uh, user provided input. So let's just say, um, create a meta variable, which is just sort of a dollar sign and then a uh, identifier. So param, so this could be anything. Uh, and then it gets stored into some variable. So we'll create another one here. And then the same variable is then passed uh, in the response uh, back to the user. So rather than matching like a specific, say, variable name, uh, meta variables allow us to say, you know, this could be anything, but this is sort of how uh, it's used. So if we do this, uh, we can see that we are matching uh, this code. And you know this, uh, instead of name, it could be, uh, I don't know, foo. And then this response object could be you know, some other name. And uh, basically, neither of these matter because we're using uh, meta variables. Uh, so they're going to match regardless of what the specific uh, sort of concrete value is. Uh, OK. So, but here, look, we have this other example where uh, we're not flagging it, but we probably want to. So again, we're getting something uh, that the user provides. Uh, there's some statement in between uh, where we're just sort of logging something. And then we're, we're writing something to the response, but it's not just the variable. It has um, you know, this other string sort of uh, concatenated there. So how, I, how might we generalize this pattern a little bit? Um, so we could say. Uh, dot 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 in the middle to say zero or more statements could happen between these two statements. You know, it, it might not be like directly reflecting to the uh, uh, back to the user. And we also might want to say, you know, well, this like user provided input is somewhere in this uh, call to res dot right, but it might not necessarily be uh, the only thing or the first thing. Really, it's like uh, it happens somewhere in there. Um, so there's actually an operator uh, that SimGrip provides that allows us to do that. That looks like this. And it's basically like somewhere in the arguments to res.write is a variable. Um, but it, it might be like complex. It might just be one thing. You know, we don't really know ahead of time. So if we run this, uh, now we match both cases. So the dot, dot, dot is matching console.log. Um, if we wanted to do you know, like some additional stuff in there. Um, this dot, dot, dot is going to sort of swallow all of those things. And then the uh, less than dot, 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 and then dot, 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 uh, greater than is basically matching uh, as long as this uh, response object is somewhere in the arguments, um, it will still match. So, all right. So basically, uh, the ellipsis operator, when there's zero or more things, we want to sort of uh, blindly match. And we have meta variables when we want to uh, grab a reference to something. So these are basically the two primitives. There's a little bit more complex stuff that we'll look at in a second, but this is really the foundation uh, of SimGrip. Other than that, um, you know you know most of it now. Um, OK, so uh, unless there are any questions, I'll uh, move on to uh, one more example. Cool. Um, so let's say, uh, so, so far we've been doing some security related examples, but let's say we have uh, some business logic we would like to enforce. It's not necessarily just directly uh, a security issue. So let's say we have a, a hypothetical financial trading application. Uh, that has the sort of business assumption that there's this function called uh, verify transaction, which must be called uh, on a transaction object before make transaction, um, because it does some sort of sanity checking or state verification to make sure that it is uh, well formed. Um, so let's see how we might enforce. Um, oh, oh no. Answer was already copied in, but we can uh, solve it together. Um, let's see. So let's say uh, we look at some example uh, test cases. 
Um, so here we're calling verify before make transaction. Uh, that's okay. But if we call uh, make transaction without verifying it first, that's bad. Uh, if we call them in the wrong order, that's bad. If we call um, just verify, that's okay. But there could be other statements uh, and so forth. So, okay, so how uh, might we express this? Um, so conceptually, what we might think is, um, you know, let's find every function that um, calls make transaction because that is potentially dangerous. And then we could filter out um, all of the cases in which uh, verify has properly been called uh, beforehand. Uh, so in, if you think about it, sometimes you want to not just write a single pattern that's like, find this. Sometimes you want to say, oh, find this and this or this, but not that, or either of these things. Um, so SEMGRIP allows you to uh, basically combine individual patterns uh, and sort of compose them in arbitrary sort of Boolean composition ways. Um, so let's look at how one might do that. Um, so we can just maybe copy some example up. So let's say we don't care what the return type is. So let's just make it a meta variable. Um, we don't care what the uh, function name is. So we can just, again, do, use a meta variable. Let's say we don't care what the uh, arguments are. Let's see, maybe move this guy. And then so there could be one or more, zero or more statements. And then somewhere we call make transaction. And then uh, there's you know a couple of statements after that. So this is basically going to find um, any function that uh, calls make transaction inside of it. Um, so we found this one and this one, and okay, seems to be doing what we're expecting. So let's find every function that calls make transaction inside of it, and then filter out uh, any that calls verify beforehand, because that's the business logic we want to enforce. Um, so here, again, I was talking about a Boolean composition of patterns. So we could say, you know, find this one or something else. And you can also say, whether something uh, should be inside like a specific, say, class or module or something. Uh, but here we're going to say and is not. So uh, a function that calls make transaction and is not a function that calls verify transaction. There could be a couple statements in between. So basically, find every function that calls make transaction and filter out the ones that uh, have verify being called first. So if we do that, we can see this first one is OK. Uh, the second one that only calls make transaction, this is bad. So we flagged that appropriately. If we call it in the wrong order, uh, we were able to flag that successfully. Uh, just verify is OK. So here we have a couple of other statements, just uh, uh, printing out to standard out, but we can see make transaction and verify are called in the wrong order. So we correctly flagged that. Um, here, the statements are in the right order, verify and then make, so that's okay. Uh, but this last example is interesting because uh, if you look at it, we're actually verifying this other object, but the make transaction call is actually getting a different transaction object. So this is probably a bug, right? Because we are verifying the wrong transaction. So currently, our pattern is not flagging this, but we would like it to. Um, so one thing that we can do is rather than saying the arguments to these are you know, anything, I don't care, we could say instead, let's use a meta variable to enforce that the argument to verify transaction is the same as the argument to make transaction. So if we do that, we can see that we are now flagging this case. Uh, which is pretty cool. So again, basically, we've just taken uh, an idea in our head, some business logic we would like to enforce, and then uh, codified that in uh, SEMGREP in about you know eight or nine lines of code in about you know three or four minutes. And that's really where we're trying to head with uh, SEMGREP. We believe in you know how can we take 
ideas and properties we want um, in like secure coding docs or on wikis or you know things you tell developers doing onboarding like how do we take all those ideas and just like consistently apply them everywhere continuously to try to help people just um, you know ship better quality code faster um, so so far we've focused on you know here are specific things we want to find um, but we also might want to like extract uh, information. So I'm not going to walk through this uh, in as much detail, but um, so basically uh, we've used uh, Sigrep for like auditing routes. So for example, like send the security team an alert anytime a developer adds a new route. You can also look for um, authorization or authentication. So for example, here um, we can see that this uh, Java Spring app um, uses the at authorize to say, you know, which permission should be checked. So we could find, you know, every route that doesn't have that. So find all unauthenticated routes. And uh, there's also, um, so basically SEMGRIP rules in their core are actually YAML. So we have this sort of simplified UI, but if you go to advanced, you can see that um, here's like the YAML equivalent. Um, this is the rule actually we've been writing. Um, and there's this message field, which you can actually use any uh, meta variable that has matched in a pattern. So you can give um, the receiver of this, uh, either um, who's running it on the command line or in, um, say, CI, you could say, hey, you know, I found this thing in this method. Um, and you can give very like contextual uh, responses. So here we can see that we use the meta variables here to print out in the message, you know, this is the function that was matched. Um, there was no path specified here, but it's a git method, um, permissions.admin. We're basically extracting these things that we matched with uh, SEMGREP and displaying them to the user. Um, so we've played around with different visualizations uh, for this. So we extracted routes from our own application and sort of visualized like which ones um, take which HTTP verbs, do they use like JWT auth or not, and things like that. Um, OK, so let's look at some advanced features. Um, so I'm not going to go through uh, these in detail. I just wanted to sort of highlight the variety of things you can do. Um, so one thing that's nice is you can either just use regexes directly or in combination with SEMGREP pattern. So here we could say, um, you know, find all calls to Boto3, which is a AWS client. Uh, for Python, and we can actually apply a regex to say like only match things that are um, uh, like an internal IP address. So we would flag this, uh, but not uh, the second. Um, we've created sort of an escape hatch where if SEMGREP doesn't provide the capabilities you want, you can actually just um, match, for example, uh, the number of bits for this RSA key and it's passed to arbitrary Python. So you could say convert it to an integer and then do a number comparison, or you could do basically whatever you want. Um, you can also do um, sort of type aware uh, patterns in Golang and um, Java specifically. So let's say you want to find calls to exec, but only on uh, runtime type objects. So basically, the special syntax here says, um, you know, find all calls to exec, but this class needs to be a runtime object. So it would flag these two, but not this other one, because it's not. Um, a runtime object. Uh, we can also match JSON, YAML, and other arbitrary files. So if you wanted to analyze an infrastructure as code, you could do that. Uh, and we also don't want to be just another tool that uh, gives more work to people. Ideally, we want to save people work and save them time. So here's a screenshot of, um, you can also add an autofix key in your SEMGREP pattern. So like, hey, every time you find this, please uh, replace it with this. So here's a screenshot. This is still sort of alpha. Uh, to be honest, but here is a, um, a screenshot of a, uh, if you integrate this with GitHub, uh, we can use the suggestion API to say like, hey, here's your, uh, you're defining this new route, but you didn't do a, a JWT authorization check. This is how we do it in our application. And you can actually sort of like auto uh, rewrite it. And so the developer can just say, oh, uh, I accept this fix rather than um, sort of pointing out a problem that they then have to figure out what to do about it. 
So uh, I've talked about just a couple of things. Uh, Semgraph has a bunch of other rule syntaxes uh, or um, sort of clauses you can use. Here's just a couple. See the docs uh, for more details. Um, so you might think like, oh, this is cool, but I don't want to write everything myself. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to. So there's a, a number of existing, I think over a thousand rules and a bunch of rule sets that are easy to get started with. So if we click here, um, so we have a couple of uh, specific rule sets that we sort of pulled together. Um, so we ported a couple of tools um, like FindSec bugs for Java, GoSec for Golang. There's also some nice contributors from the community. So Damien is a, the author of GoPerfbook, and he's written a number of uh, checks for Go code. So uh, we find it encouraging that a, a number of developers have written checks for them, not just uh, security professionals. Um, Ajin, the creator of Node.js scan, actually the sort of core engine and rule logic that his tool uses uh, is actually SEMGREP under the hood. Um, but if you want to uh, check out some rule sets to get started, we have like R2C CI. So these are just uh, sort of high signal checks, um, security audits, finding uh, a bit more things uh, and so forth. So uh, we're also working with some of the people behind the ASVS and Cheat Sheets projects, um, just trying to sort of take all this uh, domain knowledge and apply it uh, consistently, programmatically everywhere. For example, like you know, verifying if your code is complying with ASVS level one automatically, uh, maybe finding code that violates uh, Cheat Sheets best practices. Um, so yeah, if this uh, sounds exciting to you, we would love your help because uh, we're very much trying to make this a, a community effort, not just uh, something we're working on. Uh, my colleague Isaac and I gave a talk at Global AppSec SF um, this past year, where we discussed like how do you uh, try to eliminate entire vulnerability classes rather than fixing one-off bugs um, using um, basically any tool that can find um, code uh, with sort of high signal. Um, so if that sounds interesting, I encourage you to check out these slides. Uh, integrations. So SendGroup just outputs to JSON, so it's like pretty easy to add uh, to any CI tool. Uh, we also have like a Docker image that can do like diff aware scanning, so it only reports new things uh, and stuff like that. So um, basically, if you just paste in a snippet into whatever platform you use, um, you should be up and running in just a few minutes. Um, we have a SaaS app as well. Um, basically, if you have, say, dozens or hundreds of repos and you're like, well, what do we scan where? Like our Django app should get this policy, our native app should get this other policy. If you want like trends and metrics and dashboards, blah, blah, blah. Um, we have that as well. Um, yeah. So just quickly to wrap up, um, I uh, <laughs> once upon a time wrote a blog post about uh, how I watched like every single apps at Cali talk and wrote a detailed review. So if you want to uh, take advantage of my time and suffering, uh, feel free to check out that uh, post to sort of like quickly grok a lot of information in a short amount of time. Uh, I also have a newsletter called TLDRSec where I uh, again, summarize talks and provide the latest tools and resources uh, and some original research that I do. Um, so feel free to check out that if you want to. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for your time. Um, feel free to reach out on Twitter or email. Uh, again, the slides are there. And yeah, I would be happy to take any of your questions. And thanks again for your time and for having me. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Clint. Um, I know there are a couple of... Uh, questions in chat. Um, I've actually, one second, I've uh, unlocked uh, muting. So I know, uh, Tal, do you want to un unmute and ask your question? Hmm. OK. Um, yes. Yeah. So let's try. Uh, okay, so if Tal's not answering, Michael, do you want to uh, ask your question? I think I can uh, answer Tal's really quick. Um, yeah, okay. so what happens if there's an encoding function in the middle? Um, yeah, so basically what you could do is uh, add a clause that basically um, is like a pattern knot that filters out if, um, if there is a, an encoding function between the two. So you could say like, you know, this is what the vulnerable pattern looks like and, and filter out if uh, this other flow occurs, which is, you know, uh, URL parameter, um, some sort of like filtering function, and then uh, whatever the sync is. Um, so that would probably be the best way to do that. And we have a bunch of examples in the registry of uh, how we actually do exactly that. Uh, so yeah, it's a good question. OK. Fantastic. It's uh, Michael, uh, two questions. 
at uh, how does the tool handle SQL injection and what happens in the case of SQL uh, is performed via some uh, driver or library? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would say um, for both SQL injection and XXE, um, the if you think about it conceptually, many classes of security vulnerabilities are actually the same in that the uh, it's basically like something the uh, a malicious user controls, and then eventually it comes to some uh, sort of dangerous function. Um, so basically, uh, the example was cross-site scripting, but I think SQL injection and XXE are conceptually the same situation. It's just like how you get the user input and then what it eventually travels to is different. Um, so you would just have, uh, and we already have uh, rules that um, model like, okay, what are um, unparameterized SQL statements? What do those look like? How does one do like raw SQL? Um, so if user input gets there, uh, it's dangerous. Um, yeah, so I'd say that those are handled uh, similarly. Um, how, uh, let's see, in which case uh, SQL is performed by some intermediate library, like a driver. Yeah, so, so basically, um, the rule would need to have uh, codified, um, like what are the set of APIs that are potentially vulnerable? And uh, this is actually, um, if you're curious uh, how basically every uh, static analysis tools, uh, static analysis tool works, like conceptually, um, every static analysis tool is basically a couple of core components. So one is um, basically an engine that knows how to like parse source code into an intermediate structure and then analyze it. And then the other part is a set of rules or security domain knowledge, which um, then sort of uh, is fed into the engine and then the engine applies uh, those rules on source code. Um, so so I, I think more concretely, um, basically uh, you would, or we would have to add uh, checks that include knowledge of this uh, sort of intermediate libraries or drivers to basically understand how they work and how they're vulnerable to then uh, pass on to SEMgrep to then uh, flag code that uses those patterns. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the great question. Um, so uh, Jonathan uh, Wagman asked, how would you use the tool in an agile CI process? Um, that's a good question. So uh, we've actually found that um, uh, many companies have found it fairly easy. Um, so basically, um, if you use uh, GitHub Actions or GitLab Runners or Travis CI, um, basically whatever CI tool you use, um, probably there is a way to run various like linting tools that your developers may already be using. Um, so basically you can just add SEMgrep in as another lint. Um, there's like a Docker image. Um, there's also, let's see, I think if we- Lint, if I could also uh, yeah, sure. uh, add another part of the question. Um, how would you compare it to other, I mean, more regular uh, static analysis tools? I mean, would you run it together with uh, Sonar Cube or check marks or whatever? Would you run it instead? How do they offset each other? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there are some, oh, uh, so yeah, I'll answer that question in a second. But if you go to our docs and go to CI, there's basically some like, things you can just copy in for what, whichever one you have. Um, yeah, so I think uh, some companies are using uh, just one of the tools. Some are using uh, multiple. Like we, there are some uh, companies we know that are using uh, check marks and SEMgrep as well. Um, so I think there's some philosophical differences between the tools. So um, check marks, Fortify, Code, QL, and players like this uh, are sort of in the business of trying to uh, find as many bugs as possible by doing uh, sort of whole program analysis, doing uh, data and control flow uh, across many, many files. And I think SEMgrep is really leaning more into secure defaults. Like, can we um, sort of Netflix uh, talks about this a lot with their idea of like paved road. Like, can we build as security teams sort of libraries and infrastructure and tooling that developers can use that eliminate classes of vulnerabilities from ever happening in the first place, like if they're used properly. For example, like a, um, uh, a sort of object relational mapper or other like SQL wrapper library that if you use it, um, you can't have SQL injection. Um, so rather than trying to find 
SQL injection, instead build sort of base primitives that developers can use, and then use SEMGREP or some other similarly sort of lightweight tool to enforce that uh, the paved road is followed. Um, so I would say they can, these tools can be used for similar purposes, but we're sort of leaning into secure defaults rather than trying to uh, find all of the bugs, which I think in practice is either um, impossible because you miss things or is too noisy and it sort of uh, drowns people in alert messages. Um, so I would say uh, all of these tools are good. They just sort of have different um, worldviews and use cases, uh, or at least how people tend to think about things when they uh, use them. Um, but yeah, they're all good, just sort of different things, different focuses. Um, so Avi asks, can you encapsulate scripts and call other subfunctions? Uh, that's a great idea. Uh, we've been wanting that as well. Um, currently, you cannot. Um, we have some like custom sort of wrapper scripts. So because SEMgrep is very composable, you can actually um, like basically write Python to like call SEMgrep, return the results as JSON, parse those, and then like run another command from that. Um, we don't yet have built-in support into like SEMgrep core for that. Um, but that's probably going to be something we do in uh, the next couple of quarters, I think, because it, it is uh, very useful, and I want it as well. So currently, no, but hopefully soon. So, so if I could just follow up with that, um, so you're saying like things like all the uh, you know all the injections attacks. So basically, like you said, it comes down to finding uh, all the source, all the sources, all the you know all the points of input, and finding all the things, right? And you know the specifics of that might change by what kind of injection you're doing. But you still want to have one thing that finds all those sources, and you don't want to have to repeat that every time. So I'm thinking, like, to be able to like you know list that out once and then call that in each time. Totally, yeah, uh, you're exactly right, and um, yeah, that, that's currently uh, yeah, that's why I wanted that feature as well. Because uh, conceptually, yeah, there's there's sort of like a division of resp responsibility almost in terms of like yeah, like okay, let's find all the user input. Okay, let's find all the bad. Uh, command injection and XSS and blah, 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 like all the syncs, and then you just sort of connect the two. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so currently, um, there is a bit of a duplication. Um, but uh, th this honestly is not, like, there's no technical reason why it can't do that. It's just like we haven't built it yet. Hmm. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. So, yeah. Curr so currently, in your existing libraries and stuff that you have right now, there's basically just a lot of duplication of all, you know, finding those inputs and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, sources. yeah, I would say there's some duplication. I, I don't think it's a prohibitive amount, um, but it is, uh, yeah, not as concise uh, as we would like it to be. Um, yeah, but I, I think, um, yeah, we've been focusing on like adding languages uh, most recently because just, uh, you know, companies are like, oh, I want to use this, but I, I can't, you know, you don't support whatever language. So we've added a number of languages in the past couple of months. Um, but probably this next year, we'll focus on uh, other quality of life improvements like this. And are you also looking at implementing this in some way directly in the IDE, or is this more of a uh, commit phase tool? Uh, that's a good question. Um, ah, sweet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so there um, is a VS Code uh, extension as well. Basically, you can point it at a rule set, and it'll give you sort of the underlining thing um, like a linter would. Um, yeah, so we don't have. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, we don't have support for other um, IDEs yet. We probably will. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, to be honest, uh, other IDEs are there. It, this extension's like, uh, I would say, like sort of alpha or beta level. So you may encounter some bugs, but uh, I've used it and it's found some bugs in my code. So uh, I found it useful at least. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the great questions. Okay. Um, yeah. I think that's uh, that's all the questions we have. Um, so as, as Jonathan just put into the chat, uh, yeah, thanks very much for a really great talk. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, yeah, hope to see you over again sometime soon. Yeah, definitely. That's great. Thanks a lot, Clint. So we'll start now with uh, Kfir Tal's presentation. Uh, Kfir is a cyber ops consultant from Sealynx, and he will give us a presentation about K8s and vulnerabilities around it. Uh, Kfir, the stage is yours.
Thank you. Uh, do you 